1996 Mount Everest disaster. Abstract. The 1996 Mount Everest disaster occurred on 10-11 May 1996, when eight people caught in a blizzard died on Mount Everest during attempts to descend from their summit. Over the entire season, 12 people died trying to reach the summit, making it the deadliest season on Mount Everest at the time and the third deadliest behind the 16. Fatalities of the 2014 Mount Everest avalanche and the 22 deaths resulting from avalanches caused by the April 2015 Nepal earthquake. The 1996 disaster gained wide publicity and raised questions about the commercialization of Everest. Numerous climbers were high in altitude on Everest during the storm including the Adventure Consultants team led by Rob Hall and the Mountain Madness team led by Scott Fisher, while climbers died on both the North Face and South Col approaches. The events on the South Face were more widely reported. Four members of the Adventure Consultants expedition perished in the disaster, including Hall, while Fisher was the one casualty of the Mountain Madness expedition. Three officers in the Indo-Tibetan border police also died in the storm this year. Following the disaster, several memoirs were written by survivors. Journalist John Krakauer, on assignment from Outside Magazine and in the Adventure Consultants team, published the bestseller Into Thin Air, 1997, about his experience. Anatoly Bukrayev, a guide in the Mountain Madness team felt impugned by Krakauer's book and co-authored a rebuttal book called The Claim. Tragic Ambitions on Everest, 1997, Beck Weathers, of Hall's Expedition, and Lena Gamelgard, of Fisher's Expedition, wrote about their experiences of the disaster in their respective books. Left for Dead, My Journey Home from Everest, 2000, and Climbing High, a Woman's Account of Surviving the Everest Tragedy, 2000, in 2014, Lukas Ishki, also of Hall's Expedition, published his own account of the tragedy in After the Wind, 1996 Everest Tragedy, One Survivor's Story, 2014. In addition to the members of the Adventure Consultants and Mountain Madness teams, Mike Truman who coordinated the rescue from base camp, added to the story with the storms, adventure and tragedy on Everest. 2015, Graham Ratcliffe, who climbed to the south coal of Everest on 10 May, has documented in a day to die for 2011, that weather reports delivered to expedition leaders, including Hall and Fisher before their planned summit attempts on 10 May forecast a major storm developing after 8 May and peaking in intensity on 11 May. As Hall and Fisher planned their summits for 10 May, portions of their team summited Everest during an apparent break in this developing storm, only to descend into the full force of it late on 10 May. Climbers the following is a list of climbers en route to the summit on 10 May 1996 via the South Colland Southeast Ridge, organized by Expedition and Roll. All ages are as of 1996. The Adventure Consultants 1996 Everest Expedition, led by Rob Hall, consisted of these individuals. The Sherpas listed here were the climbing Sherpas hired by Rob Hall's adventure consultants. There were many other Sherpas working at lower elevations, who performed duties vital to the adventure consultants and mountain madness expeditions. Most climbing Sherpas' duties require them to ascend at least as high as Camp 3 or IV. But not all of them summit. The expedition leaders intend for only a select few of their climbing Sherpas to summit. Legendary Sardar Arpa Sherpa was scheduled to accompany the Adventure Consultants group but withdrew. Due to family commitments, none of the clients on Hall's team had ever reached the summit of an 8,000 meters peak. And only Fishbeck 
Hansen and Hutchison had previous high-altitude Himalayan experience. Hall had brokered a deal with Outside Magazine for advertising space in exchange for a story about the growing popularity of commercial expeditions to Everest Krakow was originally slated to climb with Scott Fisher's Mountain Madness team. But Hall landed him, at least in part, by agreeing to reduce Outside's fee for Krakow's spot on the expedition to less than cost as a result. Hall was paying out of pocket to have Krakow on his team this year. Scott Fisher was the lead climbing guide for the Mountain Madness expedition. The team included eight clients. Pete Cherning had decided, while still a base camp, not to make the final push to the summit. The team began the assault on the summit on 6 May, by passing Camp 1 and stopping at Camp 2 for two nights. However, crews suffered from altitude sickness and possible high-altitude cerebral edema, haze, and stopped at Camp 1. Fisher descended from Camp 2 and escorted crews back to base camp for treatment. Makalu Gaoming Ho led a five-member team to Everest that day. The previous day, the 9th of May, Taiwanese team member Chen Yunnan had died following a fall on the Lhotse face. Half the climbing team from the Indo-Tibetan Border Police North Kal Expedition from India, Subedar Swang Samanla, Lance Nakdorya Marup, and Head Constable Swang Paldor, died on the Northeast Ridge. Timeline Shortly after midnight on 10 May 1996, the Adventure Consultants Expedition began a summit attempt from Camp 4, atop the South Col. They were joined by six client climbers, three guides, and Sherpas from Scott Fisher's Mountain Madness Company, as well as an expedition sponsored by the government of Taiwan. The expeditions quickly encountered delays. The climbing Sherpas and guides had not set the fixed ropes by the time the team reached the balcony, and this cost the climbers almost an hour. There is some question as to the cause of this failure which cannot now be resolved as the expedition leaders perished. Upon reaching the Hillary step, the climbers again discovered that no fixed line had been placed, and they were forced to wait an hour while the guides installed the ropes, because some 33 climbers were attempting the summit on the same day, and Hall and Fisher had asked their climbers to stay within 150 meters, 500 feet of each other. There was a bottleneck of the single fixed line at the Hillary step. Hutchison, Kasishki, and Tasker returned towards Camp 4 as they feared they would run out of supplementary oxygen due to the delays. Climbing without supplemental oxygen, Guide Bukreya from the Mountain Madness team reached the summit first at 1307. Many of the climbers had not yet reached the summit by 1400 the last safe time to turn around to reach Camp 4 before nightfall. Bukreyev began his descent to Camp 4 at 14.30, having spent nearly 1.5 hours at or near the summit helping others complete their climb. By that time, Hall, Krakauer, Harris, Beidelman, Namba, and Mountain Madness clients Martin Adams and Clef Scherning had reached the summit and the remaining four Mountain Madness clients had arrived. After this time, Krakow noted that the weather did not look so benign. At 1500 snow started to fall, and the light was diminishing. Hall Sadar, Angdorya Sherpa, and other climbing Sherpas waited at the summit for the clients. Near 1500, they began their descent. On the way down, Angdorya encountered client Doug Hansen above the Hillary step and ordered him to descend. Hansen did not respond verbally, but shook his head and pointed upward, toward the summit. When Hall arrived at the scene, the Sherpiers offered to take Hansen to the summit, but Hall sent the Sherpas down to assist the other clients, and instructed them to sash oxygen canisters on the route. Hall said he would remain to help Hansen. 
who had run out of supplementary oxygen. Scott Fisher did not summit until 1545. He was exhausted from the ascent and becoming increasingly ill, possibly suffering from hape, haste, or a combination of both. Others, including Doug Hansen and Makalu Gao, reached the summit even later. Bukrayev recorded that he reached Camp 4 by 1700. The reasons for Bukrayev's decision to descend ahead of his clients are disputed. Bukrayev maintained that he wanted to be ready to assist struggling clients farther down the slope and to retrieve hot tea and extra oxygen if necessary. Krakauer sharply criticized Bukrayev's decision not to use bottled oxygen. Bukrayev's supporters, who include G. Weston D. Walt, Bukrayev's co-author of The Climb, 1997, state that using bottled oxygen gives a false sense of security. Krakauer and his supporters point out that, without bottled oxygen, Bukrayev was unable to directly help his clients to send, and that Bukrayev said that he was going down with client Martin Adams, but later descended faster and left Adams behind. The worsening weather began causing difficulties for the descending team members. The blizzard on the southwest face of Everest was reducing visibility, burying the fixed ropes, and obliterating the trail back to Camp 4 that the teams had broken on the ascent. Fisher, helped by Lopsang Jingbu Sherpa, was unable to descend below the balcony in the storm as year Sherpas left Makalu Gao with Fisher and Lop Sang Wen Gao, too, became unable to proceed. Eventually, Lop Sang was persuaded by Fisher to descend and leave him and Gao. Hall radioed for help, saying that Hansen had fallen unconscious but was still alive. At 1730 Adventure Consultants Guide Andy Harris, carrying supplementary oxygen and water, began climbing alone from the south summit toward Hansen and a hall at the top of Hillary Step. Krakauer's account notes that by this time, the weather had deteriorated into a full-scale blizzard. Snow pellets borne on 70 miles per hour wind stung my face. Bukrayev gives 1800 as the onset of a blizzard. Several climbers became lost on the South Col. Mountain Madness members Beidelman Guide, Clef Scherning, Fox, Madsen, Pittman, and Gamel Guard, along with adventure consultant members Mike Groom, Beck Weathers and Yasuko Namba wandered in the blizzard until midnight. When they could no longer walk, they huddled some 20 meters, 66 feet, from a drop-off of the Kangsheng face. Near midnight, the blizzard cleared sufficiently for the team to see Camp 4. Some 200 meters, 660 feet, away, Beidelman, Groom, Scherning, and Gamel Guard set off to find help. Madsen and Fox remained on the mountain with the group, to shout for the rescuers. Bukrayev located the climbers and brought Pittman, Fox, and Madsen to safety. Bukrayev had prioritized Pittman, Fox, and Madsen all of whom were from his Mountain Madness expedition, over Namba, from the Adventure Consultants expedition, who seemed close to death. He did not see weathers. Also from the Adventure Consultants expedition, all the climbers then in Camp 4 were exhausted and unable to reach Namba and weathers from their Adventure Consultants expedition. On the 11th of May, at 4.43, Hall radioed base camp and said he was on the south summit. He reported that Harris had reached the two men, but Hansen, who had been with him since the previous afternoon, was now gone, and Harris was missing. Hall was not breathing bottled oxygen because his regulator was too choked with ice. By nine o'clock, Hall had fixed his oxygen mask that indicated that his frostbitten hands and feet were making it difficult to traverse the fixed ropes. Later in the afternoon, he radioed base camp, asking them to call his pregnant wife, Jan Arnold, on the satellite phone. During this last communication, they chose a name for their unborn child, 
He reassured her that he was reasonably comfortable and told her, Sleep well, my sweetheart. Please don't worry too much. Shortly thereafter, he froze to death in his sleep. His body was found on the 23rd of May by Ed Viestras and fellow mountaineers from the IMAX expedition, but was left there as requested by his wife, who said she thought he was where he'd like to have stayed. They did, however, bring her back his wedding band. The bodies of Doug Hansen and Andy Harris have never been found. Viestras stated in the IMAX film that upon finding Hall's body, he sat down and cried beside his friend. Meanwhile, Stuart Hutchison, a client on Hall's team who had turned around before the summit on 10 May, launched a second search for weathers and number. He found both alive, but barely responsive and severely frostbitten, and in no condition to move. After consulting with Lop Sang he made the decision that they could not be saved by the hypoxic. Survivors at Camp 4 nor evacuated in time. He left them for nature to take its course, which the other survivors soon agreed was the only choice. Later in the day, however, Weathers regained consciousness and walked alone under his own power to the camp, surprising everyone there, though he was still suffering severe hypothermia and frostbite. Despite receiving oxygen and attempts to rewarm him, Weathers was practically abandoned again the next morning, the 12th of May, after a storm had collapsed his tent overnight, and the other survivors once again thought he had died. Krakauer discovered he was still conscious when the survivors in Camp 4 prepared to evacuate. Despite his worsening condition, Weathers found he could still move mostly under his own power. A rescue team mobilized hopeful of getting Weathers down the mountain alive. Over the next two days, Weathers was ushered down to Camp 2 with the assistance of eight healthy climbers from various expeditions, and was evacuated by a daring high-altitude helicopter rescue. He survived and eventually recovered, but lost his nose, right hand, half his right forearm, and all the fingers on his left hand to frostbite. The climbing Sherpas located Fisher and Gao on the 11th of May. But Fisher's condition had deteriorated so much that they were only able to give palliative care. Before rescuing Gao, Bukrayev made a subsequent rescue attempt but found Fisher's frozen body at around 1900. Like Weathers, Gao was evacuated by helicopter. Analysis the disaster was caused by a combination of events including John Krakauer has suggested that the use of bottled oxygen and commercial guides who personally accompanied and took care of all pathmaking equipment and important decisions allowed otherwise unqualified climbers to attempt a summit leading to dangerous situations and more deaths. In addition, he wrote that the competition between Hall and Fisher's guiding companies may have led to Hall's decision not to turn back on 10 May after the pre-decided time for summiting of 1400. Krakauer also acknowledges that his own presence as a journalist for an important magazine for mountaineers may have added pressure to guide clients to the summit despite growing dangers. He proposed banning bottled oxygen except for emergency cases, arguing that this would both decrease the growing litter on Everest many discarded bottles have accumulated on its slopes and keep marginally qualified climbers off the mountain. He does point out, however, that climbing Everest has always been a highly dangerous endeavor even before the guided tours with one fatality for every four climbers who reach the summit. Furthermore, he notes that many of the poor decisions made on the 10th of May were after two or more days of inadequate oxygen, nourishment, and rest. He concludes that decisions made in such circumstances should not be strongly criticized by the general population, who have not experienced such conditions. 
Krakow also elaborated on the statistical curiosities of fertility rates on Everest and how 1996 was business as usual. The record number of 12 fatalities in the spring climbing season that year was 3% of the 398 climbers who had ascended above base camp slightly below the historical average of 3.3% at that time. Additionally, 12 climbers had died that season, and 84 had reached the summit. This is a ratio of 1 in 7 significantly less than the historical average before 1996 of 1 in 4. Since the fatality rates on Everest have dropped considerably, accounting for the volume of climbers in 1996 compared with previous years, 1996 was statistically a safer than average year. In May 2004, Kent Moore, a physicist, and John L. Semple, a surgeon, both researchers from the University of Toronto, told New Scientist magazine that an analysis of weather conditions on the 11th of May suggested that atmospheric oxygen levels fell by an additional 6%, resulting in a further 14% reduction in oxygen uptake. The use and non-use of supplementary oxygen was the focus of much discussion and analysis after the disaster with the guide and Asada both being criticized by John Krakauer for not using supplementary oxygen while performing guide duties. Both men gave detailed written explanations as to why they preferred not to use oxygen but both carried a bottle on the summit day that could be used if it was needed in an emergency or extraordinary situation. There were several issues and problems surrounding radios and their use on summit day. Scott Fisher's Sada did not have a company-issued radio, but did have a small yellow radio that was owned by Sandy Pittman. Rob Hall's team also had an issue with the radio during a discussion over oxygen bottles that caused confusion. List of fatalities The following is a list of the other fatalities during the spring 1996 climbing season on Everest. These deaths were not directly related to the storm or the events of the 10-11 May 1996 Everest. Disaster. The following fatalities occurred on Everest during the fall 1996 climbing season. In the epilogue to High Exposure, David Breeshears describes encountering some of the bodies upon climbing Everest again. In May 1997, 